Merci de m'avoir invité ici à Lille. Thanks everyone and thanks for having me. Obviously today you expect me to talk about the one topic we all deeply care about, which naturally is philosophy. So in philosophy there's a couple of famous uh, figures and in fact who uh, have thought about very wise things. And one of them is a guy called Plato. So Plato was a bit of a peculiar chap actually because he had some things that he called thought experiments, which were quite a weird way of describing the way he thought about the world. In one of those experiments, he said, what if, hear me out, what if I take a couple of people from birth when they're babies and I put them in a cave and I never show them the light of day? That was the kind of person he was. So he thought about these kind of things, and he imagined them growing up in a cave, never having been outside, and then, at some point, he would ask them, what do you think the outside world is like? And of course, he would try to give them a couple of clues. And the idea was, as, as you can see in this picture, that he would project images, reflections of reality, shadows of reality, in order to make him guess what the world looks like. So the question is, to what extent, if only given shadows of reality, can those cave people re reconstruct what the actual world looks like? Right? That was a thought experiment more than a thousand years ago. Don't ask me how long it was. Well, we're going to talk about this idea, but more from the perspective, how can we if we're developing a client application, reconstruct the reality that exists out there on the web. If all we have are those reflections, if we see APIs as channels, as shadows, as reflections of knowledge. So that's today's talk, thinking about how we can have APIs in a decentralized ecosystem. And the fundamental question is, how can web clients interact with decentralized knowledge graphs? Now, the interesting bit here is that I have a different slide on my screen than the one that you are seeing right now. So I'm just looking maybe at the technical people to see if there's anything we can do about that. If not, bear with me, I will just improvise. So the basic question is like, how can we interact with decentralized knowledge graphs as clients? Okay, it jumped, that's good. So this means we need to talk about multiple knowledge graphs because being decentralized means that not all knowledge will be in a single place. So naturally, we also need to talk about multiple web APIs because every place will need its own API. Now, the sum of multiple knowledge graphs is an even bigger knowledge graph. This is well known, this is a good feature of knowledge graphs. But unfortunately, the sum of multiple web APIs, well, it's an even bigger mess, basically. So I want us to think about how we can harness the power of knowledge graphs while also harnessing the complexity that APIs can bring. I've got three parts for you today. The first is about the mythical query API. What is it and why? It is not really meaningful to talk about query APIs as such. Then I'll talk about why we are decentralizing. So I'll explain SOLID, which is a new way of storing knowledge. And finally, I'll come to the main points of how we can use APIs to have this decentralized knowledge exposed to clients. So let's dive into the first part. Now, what are web APIs? Well, web APIs, they provide access to remote, remote data of functionality, right? There's a couple of different kinds. Um, for instance, there's the old action-oriented web APIs, which you might have heard of. And then there's a newer way to think about APIs, which is document-based. And there's also a third way, which is more graph-based. Then we have uh, GraphQL, Sparkle, and so on. So let's talk a bit about um, GraphQL and Sparkle specifically. So GraphQL and Sparkle, they share a common trait, which is that they're both a language and an API, which is quite unique, because normally you have, let's say, SQL, for instance, is just a query language. There's no API for that. Conversely, there's many APIs that exist out there which are not a query language, but both Sparkle and GraphQL are both at the same time. What does this mean? Well, um, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of wrestling a bit the difference between my screen and the big screen here. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. So what does this mean? Well, if a client talks to a server, they will be using 
the Sparkle API or the GraphQL API to send a Sparkle query or a GraphQL query. But, and this is crucial, they are fundamentally different things. So it is possible to separate the query from the API. Now, what is the difference then between GraphQL and Sparkle? Well, without getting too philosophical, um, basically GraphQL queries have a meaning with respect to one single source, right? So this could be a GraphQL query, here's another one that could be the same thing, and so on. A Sparkle query, in contrast, has universal meaning across all possible sources. So this query means the same thing regardless of the source that you're asking. Now, why is this important? Well, if we have this decentralized ecosystem where data can be anywhere, you of course want to be sure that the query is understood everywhere, right? But apart from that, we can treat them as the same thing. Now, if we want to design APIs for knowledge graphs, there's a couple of misconceptions that are quite common that make it difficult for us to do so. The first misconception is that people think that if you want to have a certain abstraction on the client side, you need the same abstraction on the server side. Very concretely, if you want to build uh, GraphQL applications, you need a server that also speaks GraphQL. The second misconception is that querying would require dedicated interfaces to query, that you cannot do queries on the client side if the server does not have any query interfaces. And finally, there's another um, problem holding us back, that there's a notion that there's this one universal API which in the end will solve everything for us. I'm trying to navigate to the right slides, which is proving quite difficult here. So um, client abstractions are not limited to server set abstractions. Let me first discuss this one, right? We already saw that GraphQL is two things at the same time. It's a read write query language, and it's also a web API to execute such queries. But if indeed they're separate, it means that we can perfectly write a client side application that uses GraphQL without having GraphQL on the server. And maybe this is evident to you, but quite a few developers don't realize this. They think that GraphQL is inherently a server-side thing and that you need server-side support. Whereas actually, client libraries, they can provide GraphQL queries over non-GraphQL uh, web APIs. So that means that I can have arbitrary APIs, and if the client is sufficiently smart, I can still write GraphQL applications. So this disconnect is very important. Now, um, then to the notion of what is actually a query API, because people tend to think that whether it's GraphQL or something else, that there's inherently a difference between a query API and a non-query API. So if you have two APIs here, you might be inclined to think that the first one is not a query API, but the second one clearly is, because the second one has a query language, the first one does not. But, and this is where it gets a bit philosophical, who decides what is a query language and what is not a query language? Right? And I make this point in much more detail than a blog post that I have, but basically, it is possible to give a number to every GraphQL query out there in the world. So I can just address them by number instead of having the text. So that means that there's fundamentally no difference between those two APIs. The difference is in the expressivity of the APIs. So a query API as a label as such, I don't think is really meaningful, because every API offers some kind of query. Some are very limited, like the first API only allows me to select orders, nothing else. Some of them are more expressive, like the second one. But in the end, it's always some kind of query, whatever it is. So what an API does, in essence, is enabling filtered access to data. And the difference is the granularity, like how specific can I be and what kind of answers I want from the API. And client libraries can help to bridge the difference so if indeed you have a server that has a quite coarse API, you can compensate on the client by asking finer questions. And a couple of years ago, I think many people thought that query APIs like GraphQL would, would solve all problems. But we've seen that there's quite some more nuance to that statement, right? In the end, it is just a means to an end, right? Then on to the final misconception is the whole quest for this mythical universal API that would solve everything. Well, what we see is that the more expressive the query language, the more client-specific requests can be. And this has advantages, but also disadvantages. Think about caching, for instance. Like, if every request on the World Wide Web was wait for me, then caching would be very hard and performance would drop. Hmm? So there's always trade-offs involved in query uh, and API design. 
low expressivity, you have higher numbers of requests. High expressivity is means that you have a higher per request cost. And you need to balance these in every specific use case. And interestingly is, we've also found in my research team that basically observations that hold for a single BAP API don't always generalize to multiple APIs. So the moment you start using multiple APIs to build an application, it gets fundamentally different. So it's not because you've studied a single API that you know how multiple APIs of the same kind will behave. So this was to say goodbye to the notion of a query API. There's either no such thing or all APIs are inherently query APIs. And hence the distinction is not fundamentally meaningful. And this only is possible because we have the separation between a query language and an API that, that happens to implement a certain language. So now, in the second part, let's look into why we are decentralizing. So what is it that I'm trying to achieve and that people I work with are trying to achieve that we need multiple APIs inherently? Well, we work on something called the decentralized web of the future where every person has their own data pod. So the old web 1.0 is a decentralized document space where documents can link to other documents, right? Now, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented this first web, is working on Solid, which is basically the same idea as the web, except it's not on a document level, it's on a data level, and it's also permissioned. Hey, whereas the first web was open, didn't have any authentication or authorization, and Solid is going to be built in. So Solid builds on top of the web stack to realize these kind of things. So people can store their data behind access control, and thanks to a technology called linked data, any piece of data can connect to any other. And if you then take multiple pods together, they form a decentralized knowledge graph. There can be public parts and private parts, but the bottom line is that the knowledge is too large for any single system. Now, what is a pod concretely? Well, the idea is that data that I create or data that's created about me is stored in a place close to me. So whereas data nowadays is all spread over across different companies, I want to keep my data close to myself. And what I'm talking about is not just an idea or theory. Back in Flanders in Belgium, where I come from, we're going to give each of our six million inhabitants a data pod with solid technology. So this is how concrete we already are. So let me take you briefly through the story of a pod, which is the why uh, we're needing different APIs. On the left-hand side, you have the situation that we have today. And what you see is that I have lost control of my data. You've lost control of your data. Data is basically spread out everywhere. And there's a whole big privacy story you can tell about this, but that's not really the point, at least not to me. What I want to show there is the way we do data today doesn't work for people and doesn't work for companies, except for maybe a couple of very big ones. But fundamentally, my data is spread everywhere. It's not working for me. It's not, doing, it's not helping me in life. Hmm? But the story you often forget to tell is that it's not working for the economy either, because all those companies have to keep on collecting the same data everywhere. It costs a lot of money, and it's also legally doubtful if it's interesting to them, right? So basically, nobody, except for maybe a couple of very uh, large players, really like the left-hand situation. Now, the right-hand situation is one in which we all have our personal data vault. So conceptually, we're putting our data closer to us. We try to make it easier for people to make their data work for them. Mm -hmm. In such a world, companies can come ask for data and I can grant them permission. So the left-hand side is a world in which I have to distribute my data around everywhere, enter my email address, first name, last name, and so on. The right-hand side is one where somebody just says like, hey, I need these fields in order to give you a service. Do you agree, yes or no? And by the way, this doesn't mean that you're going to have a thousand dialogues every day. This can be automated as well. You can say things, well, actually, conferences can have my email address. I don't care. So things like that are also possible. Bottom line being, we want to make data work for people and for companies, but make it flow better. That's the idea of a personal data pod. So what does it look like very concretely? Well, let us compare the current system with data pods and also think about APIs as I'm explaining. So today, basically, any application, let's take a social media uh, application as example, all the data necessary to uh, make an application to show it to the user comes from a single place, right? So an application like this one will get my profile picture, first name, post, and so on from the same place. 
Now imagine a world in which there's data pods, in which we all have a personal data pod. Well, if this is my social media post, then the profile picture will be stored in my pod. The post will be stored in my pod. If any of you places a comment on my post, well, the comment is yours, it's going to be stored in your personal data vault. And if somebody reacts to your comment, well, that reaction will be stored in their data pod, and so on. And even a piece of data as small as a like, if somebody likes my post or your comment, well, the like is yours, it's going to be stored in your personal data pod. And then you see from an API perspective that in order to build the next view, which you're not seeing, but I am, um, the next view is basically that all of the piece of data that you need to build up this view um, can come from a single place. Huh? So, uh, no longer come from a single place, sorry. So basically, this post can be composed of data from hundreds or thousands of places if this post gets a lot of likes. So you can imagine all the API calls that go around in making this happen. Now, what does this mean for people and what does it mean for companies? Well, for people it means a transition from a coupled app and API to a decoupled app and API. Today we have the silo problem in which there's no distinction between a service and data. Let's say Facebook is my Facebook, right? My data and the service, the API, are inseparably connected. And this leads to many problems. We know most of them, but still, uh, the basic thing is that I cannot easily share a Facebook picture with my LinkedIn colleague. I have to either move the data or move the people, which doesn't really make sense if you think about it. I mean, it's 2022 and we spend a lot of time as people moving data around. This should be done by machines, right? Now, the right-hand side is what happens if you all have a personal data pod. And basically, the applications you see, the APIs you see are the same, but the data has been pushed out. The data is now in my personal data pod, and this right-hand side is a world in which I can start with one application and continue with another on the same data because the interaction happens through the data, not through the application. This is a world in which the choices that you make can be different from the choice that I make. You can have your apps, I can have mine, and we can still work together. And the magic to make this happen is this innocent-looking orange line in the middle, which is a set of APIs. Right, so we need standardized APIs to make such interactions possible. And the question for today is, how do we make that happen? But before I get to that, let's also have a look at why this is beneficial for companies too. Because if this is just a people story, just a privacy story, sorry, people don't care about privacy, companies don't care about privacy, so this is not gonna work if we don't have an economical story too. So here's what changes for companies if we start using personal data pods. Let me move my mouse cursor. Bam, magic. So um, on the left-hand side again, the situation that we have today, right? We have this single market for centralized applications where there's a competition happening, but the competition is not about who gives you the best service. The competition is about who has the most data. Think about Facebook and LinkedIn, for instance, right? How have their user interfaces, how has your experience fundamentally changed in the past 10 years? And 10 years being an eternity in IT terms, of course, right? I don't think it has. Like, yes, LinkedIn now has five emojis instead of just a like, but that's about it. They don't really innovate in that space. They don't do that, which is weird. So what you see is that on the, on the left-hand side, because of this, the race is fundamentally about data collection, all the rest is just secondary. And what you get is a weird situation in which there's a two-sided innovation problem. On the one hand, the big companies don't innovate. On the other hand, the small ones who want to innovate can't because they don't have the data. So the big ones don't innovate is a bold statement, but think about it. Facebook, for instance, has this uh, average user problem. Anything they build, the one app has to work for grandmothers and granddaughters alike. Even though this app is built for none of them, it's built for this mythical average user which doesn't exist, right? So it's very hard to innovate in that space because any change you make, you will always offend someone. Huh? Now, even more troublesome is that small players who want to innovate can enter the market. For instance, suppose that as a company that actually can give you a better LinkedIn newsfeed that actually works for you instead of for them. Well, too bad. 
they can't enter the market because they don't have the data. So they can make it work. So this whole idea of us sending our data around breaks innovation very deeply. So let's have a look at the left-hand side. The left-hand side is what happens when we use all personal data vaults. And what you see is that the competition happens on two separate levels. There's a competition happening between apps and services. There's a competition happening between providers of data pods. And the good thing is, they're independent competitions, and there's also no winner-takes-all strategy. The right-hand side is one in which you know, my grandmother can use a different app than the one that I'm using, but we can still communicate because the interaction happens through the data and not through the app. So this means that it's a world in which there's niches, right? Everybody can have their own market segment which they focus on specific users. So if people tell me, well, you know, that's a great idea and all, but how are you ever going to do better than LinkedIn and Facebook? Well, say it's easy. I don't have the average user problem. I can make apps for specific people and they can choose whatever they want to use and they can switch because the data is elsewhere. So it's this mindset, this new way of thinking about data that really helps innovation. And I've tried to summarize it in this next graph where you see what happens. Today, many companies are in the mindset of how can we harvest more data than the big ones, right? It's a whole race where they try to beat the big ones at their own game. What well, tough luck. Even if you succeed in getting as much data as LinkedIn or Google, try getting ahead of them because there's a legal ceiling stopping you. Already companies like Facebook are flirting with legislation and GDPR. So even if you had the budget to collect as much data, you'll never, never get ahead because of legislation. So this business model that maybe was viable 10 years ago is no longer going to fly. No investor is going to give you money to build something like that. So what I'm saying is that the future innovators will be those who use existing data and reuse existing data to make things better. And if you do this right, there's going to be more data, not less, and this is crucial. Because many people think when I talk about personal data vaults, ah, oh, great, now we won't be able to do anything anymore because all data will be locked up. But actually, the contrary is true. Data pods are a way to make data flow better under control of people. Let me give you a very concrete example. Imagine supermarkets and supermarket APIs, right? So my supermarket, they know what I have bought, what I am buying, they can even predict what I will be buying. And maybe one day they can also track me around the store because get, guess what, I'm scanning my groceries manually. So data, data, data. It's the whole big data idea is about how much data can we squeeze out of a single person. But let's be honest, rather than knowing exactly how I walk in the store, my supermarket would like to know what I'm buying with their competitors and online. Today, this is legally impossible and will never happen for that and many other reasons. But there's also GDPR, you know? The data of what I have bought, what I am buying, and what I will buy, this is all mine under the new laws. So it means I can say, hey, supermarket, give me my data back, delete it. And now who of you want to see my data? Who of you want to see what I'm buying everywhere? And if so, what am I getting for it? More data. Now, I'm not arguing that people should start trading their data. I'm just showing that there's a whole different mindset. Like, for those who want, there will be more data available to innovate. So this, this is why we're looking into these decentralized knowledge graphs, because I don't believe that there will ever be one API that has more data than all of our APIs combined. So that's what we're doing here. So let's have a look now at what this really means. In the third part, I'll explain how we can build APIs around these ecosystems and how we need to start thinking about APIs in order to make this happen, right? So fundamentally, the development of decentralized applications requires query, which is read-write access to knowledge graph. Now, wait a minute. Maybe you say, well, actually, is query really a necessity? Because I've been writing applications for a very long time, and you know what? I've never needed a single query. But think about it again. This is philosophy today, right? What is fundamentally a query engine? Well, if you give it some instructions, it will find you an answer. 
What is an application? Well, it has some instructions to do things with data and give an answer to show something on the screen. So if you have an application that is using multiple HTTP calls to show something to a user, you are using query. First of all, as we said before, any API is a query API, but that's a cheap one. But second, if you're not directly using a query engine, you are just being a query engine yourself, just a very specific one. So any application that is basically doing a whole sequence of operations, it is a query engine, just a hard-coded one for a very specific case. In essence, what we're doing all the time is recoding that idea, right? So we're just basically building new custom um, use case specific query engines every time again. So let's take abstraction of this notion. Let's just say that conceptually, there's always a query. You want to read some data, you want to write some data, and fundamentally, you don't really care how it works. It just has to get done, right? So this is why we have this very abstract picture of an intangible knowledge graph. Some application needs to ask some questions to this knowledge graph. This is query fundamentally. Now, what you also see is that the knowledge on the server side is quite big and complex. So if we build applications, we will never get all of the knowledge from the server and bring it to the client. And most of the times, we're not even allowed to see all the knowledge because it's partitions for different users and permissions and so on, right? So what we're doing is basically creating the illusion on the client side that you have the whole thing. If I log into an application, I see data, it's pretending that I have all the data locally, whereas actually I don't. So building applications on top of APIs is all about maintaining the illusion. And this is a point where I refer back to my opening slide about Plato and the cave, right? What we're doing here is on the client side, creating the illusion that the whole world is somehow there based on the shadows, reflections that we get from the bigger knowledge graph. So this is how it connects. Because inherently, we are building a client-server system where all of the knowledge on the server cannot be transferred or should not be transferred um, to the client. Now, how do we concretely do this? Well, obviously, we put an API in between. It could be a JSON API. So with a JSON API, for instance, uh, we make multiple HTTP requests to get specific parts of the knowledge. And in order to make this work, most JSON APIs will provide a document abstraction. They will pretend that actually the knowledge is structured as a set of documents. Note that this is not true. It's just something we make up, right? Knowledge is intangible, it has any form, but in order to make it easy, we put it in documents and we transfer it around through an API. But fundamentally, the choice is arbitrary. Like, what is it a single document really depends on how you optimize for specific cases. So there's no one true way to make the API, it's just conceptually what we're trying to do. And then when we say GraphQL, when we say query API, and what, what people still, still use, well, a query API in that context is actually an API that combines multiple calls that would have been done by the JSON API, right? But from a knowledge perspective, there's no difference because the way you divide things in documents is arbitrary anyways. So what we have here is conceptually one document that corresponds to a virtual document, right? So every GraphQL answer is a document that just happens to contain all the data that matches your query. But fundamentally, there's no difference between this JSON API or this GraphQL API. It's just a different granularity. This is the story how it works if you have one client and one server. Now let's have a look if what happens if you start decentralizing. So what happens is instead of having one big platform, we all have our own data spaces in which data is located. So let's go through the same exercise again, step by step, but now have a look at how it differs if there's multiple locations where data is. So what you see on the left-hand side is basically a ginormous knowledge graph. It is too big to be in one location. Also, we're not allowed to store it in one location because your data and my data cannot be together fundamentally. So what we see is the knowledge graph is distributed across multiple servers, some of which you can access, some of which you cannot. And the role of the application is essentially the same, to maintain this illusion, right? To pretend that you're seeing the whole thing, whereas actually the whole thing is too big to get in memory. Well, of course, what we do is APIs, right? We can have APIs on each point. 
But this time we might not want to use a JSON API directly because uh, we have data in different locations. We somehow need to reconcile it together. We somehow need to make sure that indeed, if I'm talking about something that, and you're talking about the same thing, that this can be connected concretely. If I have a social media post and you comment on my post or you like my post, this comment and like needs to be connected. So this is why there are APIs that are aware of these linked pieces of data. But nonetheless, same thing. It's linked data, but there are APIs exposing data. Now, of course, um, there's also different abstractions, right? There's not just one API to link data. There's APIs that are document-oriented, some are graph-oriented, and there's even different kinds of document-oriented uh, APIs. So this is the point where it starts getting difficult for the server, right? Because there's so many APIs, what kind will be used, and what API can we expect on the server side? And we could be tempted to say, you know what, let's just standardize on one API, but remember, one of the misconceptions was that there is no universal API. There is no one API that will solve everything. So we will have to deal with different APIs. And to make matters worse, every source can expose the same knowledge through multiple different APIs. So just one API per source is not even uh, the answer to this. And by the way, this is not just fiction. It's already happening today. You see different services offering, for instance, what they call a REST API, so a document API, and a GraphQL API to the same data. So these things will all exist. And then the temptation is to say, you know what, we'll use the same solution as we did with the um, single server. Namely, we'll put an API in there. We'll use a query API, a graph-oriented API, which will give access to all of the others. But there's a problem, because where are you going to put this API? You cannot put it on any single server. And if you put it on every server, we've well, got the same problem again. So there's no way to create this one API that will just interface to all of the others, because then you've built a centralized system again. Data is inherently decentralized. We can't do this. What we can do is find a solution on the client side. Because remember, GraphQL is both a query language and an API. So let's pretend we don't have the API. We're just going to use a query language. Well, this means that we can still write applications that pretend to be doing GraphQL, except on the client, there's also a library that will translate GraphQL queries into different API requests. And now here you think, well, isn't this going to be a very complex library then? Yes, but the benefit is that we only have to write it once. We can reuse it in multiple applications. And also, you don't have to build this from scratch. It's exactly these kind of things that my research team is looking at. So this is the conceptual way out of this. We have to accept that in a decentralized system, knowledge will be in different places, will have different APIs, but we can still pretend, we can still create this illusion that we live in a simpler world by moving query to the client side. So this is why I say that conceptually, every application is a query engine, because that's what we do. And if you actually follow that and just turn it into queries, it makes things much easier. You don't have to care about the diversity that exists in the network. The query library solves that for you. And this notion of query is crucial to make applications in a decentralized world sustainable because it allows applications to make fewer assumptions. Because if I see now that applications being built for solid in this decentralized world, I see that they try to bind to specific APIs rather to bind to the knowledge. And the trouble is, the knowledge evolves, but the API also evolves, right? So in the end, applications break quite soon. Because people hard code assumptions about where data is located and how it is structured in order to build applications. And those assumptions break quite fast. But if we have query, we have a more sustainable contract because the kind of data you want, conceptually, you're asking the same question time and time again. So this stays constant. Like if you're an application that does car insurance, well, in, in 10 years, you'll still be an application doing car insurance. So your query will conceptually be very similar, but the APIs might have completely changed. So it's a way of change management to say, you know what, let's build the application with query, even though the server might not offer a query because it makes it more sustainable. So what we're doing here is binding to the data, binding to the knowledge, rather than binding to specific channels. What this fundamentally means is if we think this way, if we really think the large-scale decentralized way, we're transitioning from API integration to data integration. 
And if you look at current applications on the web that use multiple sources, well, they depend on hard coding those API integrations. And yes, of course, there's many tools available that help us do this, but think about it. Tools actually make the problem worse rather than helping it because they make it easier to do the wrong thing. And as such, we all do the thing that's less sustainable. And the central assumption in this transition is that actually it will be easier to solve data integration problems than it is to solve API integration problems, especially if you're dealing with a lot of APIs. It also means that we need to invest in tooling to have integration on the client side. So this whole notion of query on the client, of course, means that we need client-side investments. And interestingly, once we figure out the right core APIs to use, we can also have a new concept of auxiliary APIs for use cases. Because if you look at all those sources, all those data pods, the duty that they have is to make sure that they can securely expose data for repurposing it in different contexts. That's their only job, just the basic API so you can reuse data in applications. But sometimes applications have specific needs like um, auto-completion or they want indexes, they want to maintain history and so on. Does that mean that every data source will need all of those APIs? Well, no, because some APIs like auto-completion can be built from other APIs. So basically you get a new concept of re-APIs whose only job is to take an existing API and repackage data in another format. And this gives the possibility of having API as a service, where basically there will be indexers, there will be auto-completion engines which can work on top of any source. That's a very different way to think about APIs. Because those re-APIs can be dockerized, they can be reusable, can be repurposed in different contexts. So you don't depend on the source to implement all kinds of APIs, you can just implement them on, on top of a couple of uh, core APIs. So today it talks about the flawed notion of a query API, how that doesn't exist and how basically, if you think about it, every app is a query engine. So why not make it explicit? Why not actually do queries? Then I've talked about Solid and why we decentralize and why I think it's going to be important in the future to reckon with the fact that there's going to be many hundreds, if not thousands of APIs applications will have to use. And finally, I described to you how we should repurpose APIs, how we should see them as just a means to an end, but how we should fundamentally not code against APIs anymore, but code against declarative queries which tell the client what you want and then let the client figure it out instead of doing the things that you want yourself. What this means is that I think we're moving to a state in which web APIs really become just a means to an end. And the end, for my use cases, I see as client-side knowledge graph tooling. Fundamentally, we're interacting with data, we're interacting with knowledge. And this means three things. First, crucial is that client and API abstractions can be different. They don't have to be the same. Yeah? So feel free to do GraphQL on the client or something else, the server can do something else too. And if you have those reusable uh, client-side libraries, they can separate the what from the how. So basically, your job as developer is then to tell, hey, this is what I want to do. And the job of the query engine is to find out, okay, this is how your request is translated into multiple HTTP requests that satisfy the data demand. Second, every API is a query API. There's no difference. So every client is a query client, even if you don't realize it, you're always doing queries. That's what we do. It's a distributed database. And also, no single API is a final answer. Right. So we have to start designing APIs as part of an ecosystem. Rather than trying to find the one API, it's, it's more about what API would be beneficial for the ecosystem so that these and these applications would have a better performance. Um, and if we do that, the question becomes more, how can APIs help rather than replace intelligent clients? Uh, so instead of doing all of the work, it's more about helping clients do the work better. So. What this is all about is basically finding out what the right means are to maintain the illusion. How do we identify the right vessels for knowledge such that the prisoners in the cave can form an adequate image of what reality is? That is what it's all about. Thank you.